Welcome to Beat Cancer, the official podcast of the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you for joining us in our debut of this podcast, which is an in-depth discussion of the science, research, and advancements taking place at our National Cancer Institute designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm Chris Joyce. And I'm Stephanie Wynn. We will also examine proactive approaches to cancer prevention, and most importantly, how we are breaking barriers to beat cancer in our region and beyond. Joining us today is the director of the Cancer Center, Dr. Primo Laura. Now, Dr. Laura is a medical oncologist whose principal research interests are in the field of developmental therapeutics, particularly in genitourinary and thoracic malignancies, as well as in cancer biomarker development. Along with being an oncologist specializing in cancers of the lung, kidney, prostate, and bladder, Dr. Lara has an international reputation as a research scientist. He is the first Filipino-American to lead an NCI-designated cancer center. We should add he goes by Lucky Lara around here at the Cancer Center. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Lara. I am honored to be joining both of you on this inaugural podcast. I, I, and thanks, Stephanie, for pointing out that uh, uh, I'm the first Filipino-American to uh, ever step into the shoes of a cancer center director. Uh, you know, uh, diversity is one of the things that this country has valued over right. generations. And uh, that same diversity is expected uh, at, uh, at the level of the NCI centers. And uh, I I'm proudly representing brown-skinned people in this role, so I'm I'm uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. Thank you. Uh, we are so fortunate to have you as the leader of the Cancer Center, Dr. Lara, and very proud that you are the first Filipino American to lead a cancer center that is designated by the NCI. But first, why don't you start out explaining why so many people know you as Lucky? You like to go by Lucky Lara. What's behind that story? Well, everyone. Uh, asks me that question, but uh, I think when people learn that my nickname is Lucky, uh, especially my uh, patients who um, have the misfortune, of course, of being diagnosed with cancer, but uh, they uh, often would remark that if they if they end up with an oncologist, they'd rather have that person named Lucky. So, uh, right. well, um, Filipino uh, families uh, are known to give their children nicknames uh, beyond their uh, beyond their given names, which are uh, the formal uh, names. And my real name is Primo. That's I'm a junior. My dad was Primo Senior. Um, my childhood nickname was Lucky, and uh, I wish Lucky came from uh, you know a lottery win or sitting at a, a table in Vegas and someone hitting the jackpot for me. Uh, I was actually uh, named Lucky because I was born between two infant deaths in my family. Oh. And so oh. I was uh, an older baby brother and a younger baby brother I had uh, died, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, in infancy. And so my mother, believing that bad luck uh, comes in threes, and I survived, mm. uh, called me the lucky one. So I'm lucky. What a wonderful uh, story. Yeah. I, uh, eventually, uh, there were more children than just those uh, the three of us. I understand uh, a family of we're, eight. And yeah, you were we're a big family. And by a single, single mom, which intrigued me because I was a single mom, but I only raised two. Yeah, and she was a so, superwoman. Um, right. My, so my mom uh, raised us all as a single mom, and I, I'm the fifth of eight surviving children. Uh, and all of us living within a couple of hours away from each other here in Northern California, uh, were where my uh, mom decided to migrate during the Marcus dictatorship. Uh, so she uh, figured out that the future back then, because of a uh, cruel dictatorship in the Philippines, uh, she needed greener pastures. And she found uh, the welcome shores of the United States. Very wise woman, very courageous, and uh, I'm sure she's very proud of you. Um, uh, and and us of her. You know, she's almost 84 now, and uh, and she's uh, uh, she's um, also living with cancer uh, herself. And so mm. uh, there's a lot of um, uh, connections here that we can talk about during the course of this podcast. Absolutely. Well, Chris, uh, I know we wanted to get into um, 
You know, the significance of being an NCI designated cancer center, I think a lot of folks don't realize this really sets us apart. And it does um, because uh, uh, the designation from the National Cancer Institute, I think, um, provides more than just a good housekeeping stamp of approval of, at the highest levels. Uh, but it also applies a set of expectations and requirements that only a few cancer centers are able to match and exceed. And so when uh, people with cancer um, end up uh, in within our walls or people who are at risk of developing cancer end up in our clinical studies, they know that they have a brain trust here at our cancer center that's been uh, rigorously assessed and evaluated and have met and exceeded the highest standards that have ever been um, required of, uh, of any institution. So uh, there are only 72 NCI designated cancer centers in the U.S. and uh, only 52 of those are designated at the highest level and that's the comprehensive status. At its core, an NCI designated center has a grant from the National Cancer Institute. And that grant, it's called a Cancer Center Support Grant. We lovingly call it the CCSG. That grant uh, uh, provides taxpayer dollars uh, for us to be able to leverage, uh, to uh, do research, uh, perform outreach, uh, educate the next generation, and develop new approaches that will uh, control and knock on wood, cure all cancers in the future. The other thing I think that people have to keep in mind when um, there is uh, that designation hanging out the front door um, is that um, uh, the uh, that represents uh, that the center has high quality and high impact cancer research. And uh, that research often People think of research and imagine a, uh, a scientist in a white coat, you know, uh, uh, dealing with mice and, and Petri dishes and Bunsen burners. Uh, that happens at our cancer center and, and wonderful discoveries happen in the laboratory. But uh, the research that the can our cancer center does transcends laboratory research. We also do research in the clinic and we do so in the form of clinical trials. Uh, those are uh, studies where we test brand new drugs or combination of drugs or new devices or even test biomarkers that, that uh, we can relate uh, to the activity or action of certain drugs. All of these are tested uh, in a clinical trial. Uh, people with cancer or at risk of developing cancer uh, volunteer to participate in this in these clinical trials, and I'll tell you, these trials uh, are able to offer uh, people the most cutting edge treatments and diagnostics uh, that are uh, are so uh, promising that uh, many of them will become the standard of care in the near future. But patients get access to them um, early through the clinical trials process. So clinical research, basic science research, and um, all the work that we're doing in community outreach and engagement and education are all uh, components of, a, uh, of, a, of an NCI designated cancer center. So uh, if, if you're listening today and you have cancer or have a loved one who has cancer, uh, make it a point to get, uh, get an opinion from uh, an expert from an NCI designated cancer center. Uh, I think it'll be worth uh, that person's while. Well, let's talk about one of your top priorities, Dr. Lar, which is really increasing diversity in our clinical trials. And how, why is that so important for us and also for patients? Yeah, uh, that's a uh, important, um, important uh, priority for our cancer center uh, staff. Uh, uh, we absolutely need to ensure that uh, people participating in clinical trials fully represent the population that they're drawn from. So uh, 
it's no use if we do clinical trials and it's all the same kind of person that's being enrolled in those trials because guess what? Those trials, even uh, if they're successful, may not be completely generalizable or applicable to the population at large if it's only uh, being tested in a small uh, subset of the people uh, who develop cancer. So we absolutely need to ensure that all of our clinical trials uh, draw from the, the rich diversity of people who live in the United States. Um, so all colors and creeds, all lifestyles and, and, and countries of origin somehow need to be represented in our clinical trials because only then will the results of those trials, positive or negative, be generalizable? I think that's the key there. It, they are then translatable uh, to the general population at large once those trials are reported. So uh, to all of you listening today, if you have cancer or, have, or, know, or know of someone uh, who has cancer, when you do come to a uh, to your clinic appointment or you get to see your oncologist or your surgeon always ask is there a clinical trial for me and is there a uh, if, if there is a clinical trial how can you get involved in that trial either as a volunteer or a supporter of that study now you mentioned uh demographics and um just a large group you know to be able to be representative of of patients so that we can treat really more people so that they can be applicable to more different uh, people. And geography then comes into play with that as well, because we're, we are our cancer center is located for anybody that doesn't know in Sacramento, California. But Dr. Laura, we, we reach a much larger and we treat a much larger region than that, correct? That's right. Um, in, in our neck of the woods here in Northern California, uh, we uh, serve a population um, across a broad geographical area that includes both urban and rural communities. Uh, and, and our geography uh, takes us all the way out to the borders of Oregon and Nevada, uh, all the way out to the coast and down the Central Valley. Uh, we are in Sacramento, like you mentioned, Chris. So we're deep in the heart of the Central Valley. So we are uh, elbow to elbow with our uh, fellow citizens here, where we we all share the same ecosystem, and uh, uh, and we are proud to be in a area of the nation that's so diverse uh, in terms of our people, right? And uh, in fact, we are in an area that's called a majority minority um, uh, region, where uh, uh, where we are blessed with a uh, a makeup of people of different races and ethnicities. Uh, it's not just um, uh, all Caucasian or white. And uh, we we have a, uh, a, a nice proportionality and representation from uh, Caucasians, from Latinos, from Asian Americans, from uh, Asian Pacific Islanders and Native Americans and African Americans. And this representation makes us uh, really a rich um, catchment area. And uh, that's the catchment area that we're drawing from when we uh, speak of clinical research, our clinical care, and the impact we're delivering back to our, uh, to our communities. So it's a big, it's a big catchment area, and uh, we are, uh, really seek to provide the best service and the best opportunities for participation and research for all of the citizens in our catchment area. And it also does it not give us this opportunity to really look at the cancer burden and how it affects different populations and how we can reduce um, that cancer burden, um, equalize um, healthcare access for all. Um, why don't we break some news on this podcast. Um, Dr. Lara, can you tell us about the new health equity center you envision? Yeah. So, uh, Steph, uh, the, uh, the, our cancer center has been around for uh, a long time now, several decades. And, and uh, for many years, our cancer center had been focused on uh, the, uh, the, the best approaches to mitigating the many disparities that uh, we have been observing in our catchment area and beyond. 
when we mean disparities, those are differential outcomes where a, a group of individuals with cancer uh, who ought to have uh, similar or relatively comparable outcomes don't. Um, and and there are many things that underpin these differences, and uh, we've studied those over the past many years of the existence of this cancer center. And so what we are envisioning is a way to transcend just um, uh, simply cataloging these uh, differences in outcomes and incidents and, and the differences in the rates of cancers in these different populations, but also working on impactful ways of mitigating or solving those disparities. And uh, in so doing, we are uh, launching a new center uh, here within our cancer center. It's a center within a center, and we're calling that center uh, the Center for uh, uh, Advancing Cancer Health Equity. Uh, cancer health equity is that state, is that glorious state where uh, we've uh, uh, eliminated these uh, artificial differences in outcomes that come with uh, uh, that come with uh, where you are born, or what your insurance is, or or what exposures you've had in your communities and and uh, what your socioeconomic status is or your Those gender are, right your gender yeah yeah uh, uh, i'll give you some uh, examples here um in our catchment area we uh, we know that uh, certain cancers are known to be the top killers and and those are fairly similar when you look at what uh, the, the top five killers are in our catchment area and across the state and across the U.S. The same types of cancer show up. It's lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreas cancer, and colorectal cancer. They're, they're uh, usually in the top five cancer killers anywhere you go in the United States. But unique to our cancer uh, center's catchment area, for example, we uh, observed that uh, there's a uh, fairly high higher than expected incidence of liver cancer in Latinos and in Africa and in Asian Americans in our catchment area. And it's not just a higher rate of cancers in those populations, but a higher death rate as well. Um, so that's a disparity, right? When you're seeing a, a higher disparity. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, there are many explanations for that not the least of which is that liver cancer is a preventable cancer in, in many individuals because it's associated with either viral infections, uh, hepatitis mm -hmm. B or C can uh, uh, help uh, the formation of liver cancer as well as uh, alcoholic liver disease, as well as fatty liver disease, obesity and uh, and 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 other modifiable things can contribute to the rate of liver cancer. So, liver cancer is in many ways, uh, in some in many individuals, a preventable cancer. And so, in these populations that I mentioned, in Asian Americans and Latinos, um, uh, these this disparity in uh, higher rates of liver cancer and um, and um, and similar malignancies, I think, can be mitigated by uh, helping solve some of these um, uh, problems that lead to liver cancer. And can we reduce the rates of liver uh, viral infections? Can we reduce the rate of obesity-associated liver cancer by helping provide our communities with better uh, uh, education uh, about uh, the obesity epidemic? Uh, helping helping solve the problem of food deserts, where we provide our communities access right. to uh, better nutrition and not rely on, say, uh, fast foods, where you have uh, really um, uh, foods that uh, promote obesity rather than reduce mm -hmm. it. So uh, we have a mission here that I think the Cancer uh, Equity Center that we're establishing will uh, help uh, identify not just identify, but solve. Wonderful. Well, hey, Dr. Lar, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of brag on our cancer center a little bit. Now, we have 
the the fortune, good fortune of being associated with the UC Davis um, campus itself, the the university, and we have the one of the top veterinary schools in the world there, and we partner with them when it comes to comparative oncology, but also outside of that, we have other other aspects, and I just I'm giving you a couple ideas that you can touch on these or however else you would like to brag on our um, on our cancer center, but also maybe even the career development opportunities that we're um, creating through the Calabrese K-12 um, grant or anything else that you'd like to just highlight. Sure. You know, I, I'm sure the listeners of this podcast are somewhat maybe familiar with uh, UC Davis. Uh, you're probably tuning in because um, uh, you're part of the Northern California community, or, or maybe this is a way for you to uh, get more acquainted with, with us here in our cancer program. Well, let me start by saying we are what is called a matrix center or a matrix organization under the aegis of the University of California. A matrix organization is one that cross cuts across all of the schools, colleges, uh, and departments within the University of California, this uh, really wonderful uh, university. UC Davis is a public land, graph, uh, land grant university. It was established in 1908, and we are proud to be one of the nation's top five best public universities. We are uh, really a, uh, a stellar example of what a public university ought to be. We are home, UC Davis is home to over 35,000 students. And we have about 24,000 faculty and staff to support those students. Um, we have over 100 uh, undergraduate majors and over 100 graduate programs. And we have two campuses, one in Davis, California, and another here in Sacramento. Hmm. The UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center is in both campuses. Now, we're not just here in Sacramento. We're actually in both of the UC Davis campuses. We have a presence there. We have members from both campuses, and we are a robust matrix organization. Um, uh, it's also interesting that um, uh, UC Davis is also home to uh, uh, not just our, no our nationally ranked NCI designated cancer center. We're also home to the nation's number one ranked school of veterinary medicine. Uh, and we're also uh, home to the nation's number one ranked college of agriculture and, and, and environmental sciences. And what we've done in our cancer center is leverage the strengths of this university from our scientists, et cetera, and leveraging the strengths of these uh, top-ranked schools and colleges and many other departments within uh, UC Davis to advance our work in cancer research and clinical care. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, our School of Veterinary Medicine gives us access to uh, uh, the uh, outstanding faculty and, uh, uh, and research uh, uh, activity that's being done in the vet school uh, so much so that we've organized one of our big research programs around uh, 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 around veterinary oncology. So we call our that research program, quote unquote, comparative oncology, because we're using uh, the uh, lessons learned from our companion animals, our pets, dogs and cats, who also develop cancer, as we all know, right? They, mm -hmm. they live with us, uh, they breathe our air, sometimes they eat our food, uh, <laughs> they don't smoke, but, but they're exposed to the many things we're exposed mm -hmm. to in our households. And uh, many of our uh, beloved animals also develop cancer. And what we uh, uh, end up doing here in our cancer center is learning from our companion animals from their, uh, their own journeys with cancer and using that, um, that knowledge base and that experience and, and be able to learn from that and uh, transfer that knowledge into how we approach human cancers. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating field and, we've and we have so many remarkable examples of how we've taken 
studies that we've done in the vet school in companion animals, uh, for example, dogs with cancer, and be able to translate that into human studies, uh, human clinical trials where we're uh, translating the work done in dogs with cancer to humans with cancer. We have the story of uh, Josie, a beautiful chocolate uh, Labrador retriever I was able to meet, who's part of our comparative oncology program, featured in, I'll put in a plug, for synthes- in our Synthesis magazine, which I think was the winter 2021 uh, issue, if you want to read more about that. Dr. Lara, what's the next steps with this uh, program, though? Um, I, I know there's been talk of, you know, trying to sequence you know, and maybe you could explain what that term is really. Uh, sure. But sequence uh, canine tumors and how that might help us. Yes. Yeah, so uh, one of the uh, initiatives that we are planning within our cancer center's comparative oncology program is a is an effort to uh, characterize the uh, the tumors that occur in companion animals in a more precise and comprehensive way. Uh, in the old days, you would you would characterize a tumor based on its location, right? So if if a, if a dog develops cancer in the bladder, it's bladder cancer in dogs, uh, and then uh, we would then characterize it further by looking at that tumor under the microscope and figuring out whether it looks just like the human version of the of that cancer. Mm-hmm. But there's more than meets the eye uh, with these cancers. And as you all know, um, um, these cancers are also uh, diseases uh, that are genetically driven, that uh, deep, within the, uh, uh, with deep within the cells that make up a tumor mass or a cancerous mass are uh, strands of DNA that uh, uh, represent the true biology of that cancer. And so uh, what we're planning to do in, uh, uh, in the near future in the comparative oncology program is take samples of these canine tumors and uh, extract the DNA out of those canine tumors and then sequence that DNA. In other words, try to decode the DNA uh, from these uh, dog cancers and then be able to uh, create a remarkable uh, and robust database where we have a a list, for example, of what genetic aberrations or genetic mutations are that exist in dog tumors. And then we'll be able to then compare that to what we know about human cancers that have Mm -hmm. been extensively uh, sequenced already. And so you could could imagine the power of having such a data set, right? Then you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to now learn more about what drives a dog tumor that makes it very similar or different from a human cancer. And then uh, you could take that further because then you can design drugs Mm -hmm. or approaches or diagnostics uh, that uh, would be specific to that kind of cancer. So we are uh, going to be uh, launching that within the next uh, uh, few uh, months here at our cancer center. And uh, we hope to be, be able to uh, uh, work with the National Cancer Institute as well in pulling our uh, uh, own experience uh, together with their with their own experience and maybe having a much larger data set that could be accessible to many other researchers from across the nation, not just to us, but make it available to uh, other researchers uh, in the country. Oh, that's, you know, it's, it's exciting news and, and it's not just, you know, it, it's for those of us who love our dogs too, because we'll learn more about what causes cancer in dogs. I've lost three dogs to cancer and it's just, you know, terribly heartbreaking. These are like yeah, members my, of the family. I know, I know you're my, a dog my own dog, too. my own yes. dog Fudge, who's Fudge. a Labradoodle developed a, uh, a particular, particularly nasty cancer of his upper jaw. And I took him to UC Davis mm-hmm. um, to our veterinary hospital here, and he got uh, world-class care, just like any human gets world-class care at our mm-hmm. uh, cancer center here in Sacramento. Uh, my dog get, got the same high-class care at the vet school 
Uh, he's been cancer free now for four years. Oh, that's great. That's great. He's turning uh, 14 this year, and uh, it, it's been remarkable. But uh, cancer affects us all, right? Our humans and our uh, and our companions as well, our companion animals. We all get touched at some point by cancer, and that's why I think the research uh, that we do here is so important because uh, that's the really the only way we could move the chips ahead you know we move it mm -hmm. forward uh, uh so our our goal here is not, not to make any lateral passes ahead i hate the sports reference but here we are in <laughs> football you you tend not to uh uh win a game with lateral passes but you need to have a forward pass uh we're always aiming for a forward pass whenever we're doing our research whether it's in companion animals or in humans um it's always a forward pass that we're interested in Excellent. Well, what about um, the White House has recently reignited uh, the cancer moonshot, which uh, is really exciting for a lot of us in oncology. How do you think that'll benefit us at UC Davis? And what can we bring to the national effort to end cancer as we know it? We are all, of course, pleased in the cancer community that uh, the White House uh, with President Biden and the First Lady uh, announcing that they are reigniting uh, the cancer moonshot. Uh, then Vice President Biden had uh, been a strong advocate for cancer uh, research and clinical care with the original moonshot. He himself has been touched, with, uh, touched by cancer. And so it makes a perfect sense that he is so uh, motivated and devoted to uh, support cancer research. The new goals for the cancer moonshot as uh, as announced by the White House was uh, to cut uh, the death rate from cancer by at least 50% in the next quarter century. That's a big audacious goal, but I think it is doable. Uh, a 50% reduction in cancer deaths in 25 years can be achieved with smart investments in um, in uh, technologies and in um, uh, new agents uh, that are targeted towards uh, the uh, the underpinnings of cancer. You know what makes cancer tick. Uh, in so doing, I think uh, the next moon sh this new moonshot uh, seeks to improve the experience of people and their families living with and surviving cancer. So uh, the White House did give uh, a nice uh, overview of the uh, of what they see the new moonshot will be uh, doing. So one of them is to uh, uh, ensure equitable access to screening and prevention. There's nothing like, uh, it's nothing like prevention uh, to uh, solve the cancer problem, right? Um, uh, there, it's one thing to treat established cancer, uh, but it's much more difficult to deal with cancer that's already here. It's already spread. It's much more difficult to cure that particular cancer than it is to prevent it. So uh, cancer prevention um, for the cancers that we know can be prevented through, say, tobacco cessation mm -hmm. or um, HPV vaccination. Uh, uh, I'm sure the audience here uh, knows that certain cancers caused by a virus called human papillomavirus uh, are completely preventable with a, with a very effective vaccine. And we have uh, some very um, high rates of HP-related cancers in our what we call our catchment area, the region that we serve. Um, why is that, do you think, Dr. Lauren? What can be done about that? Well, it's, it's because... Um, uh, well, uh, it's because uh, many of these um, uh, cancers are not being uh, uh, prevented in the first place with the appropriate vaccine. Uh, the uptick of the HPV vaccine in our catchment area is, uh, I'll just say, embarrassingly low. Uh, and it is the same way across the nation. So there's work mm -hmm. to be done in trying to get people at risk. Um, of developing cervical cancer or head and neck cancer from HPV, uh, from developing those cancers. They're, they're, 
we could do a lot better by delivering HPV vaccination. And uh, there are many causes for the low uptick, Steph. Um, one of them is that HPV vaccinations have to be given in a series. There's usually a couple, and they're not bundled with the other standard vaccines right. that we hmm. offer uh, uh, that age group, right? So you'll have to have an extra visit. And and it's also harder because of uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, we offer this in a certain age group, and uh, there are many parents uh, who are uncomfortable uh, recognizing that their children are sexually active or will become sexually active, right. and and having a difficult time having that talk about uh, about uh, uh, how HPV uh, is transmitted. So there are many social and uh, uh, personal factors that come in, and that's where uh, we could step in and provide a service, right, by educating mm -hmm. um, our citizens about the uh, the role of HPV vaccination and in preventing cancer, and how this uh, uh, very effective cancer can, I'm uh, sorry, this very effective vaccine um, can help. Uh, mitigate that disparity that you've pointed out, Steph, about the high uh, rates of these types of cancers in our communities, you could eliminate that by uh, providing the HPV vaccine to everyone when they're in the appropriate age range. It is so important. And that's just prevention, right? Answers, uh, yeah. The next step is screening. You know, screening uh, is when we're trying to find cancers early mm. in people who are uh, asymptomatic or don't exhibit any symptoms related to the cancer. So screening is different from prevention. You know, prevention is uh, uh, stopping the cancer from forming in the first place in, in people. And you could do that, like I said, through tobacco cessation, through vaccination, through uh, uh, preventing obesity and uh, staying away from alcohol. There are many ways to prevent cancer and, and exercising uh, uh, regularly. All of those prevent cancer. But sometimes some cancers can't be prevented. Uh, cancer sometimes will form because of bad luck or because of inadvertent exposures. For example, chronic episodic exposures to wildfire smoke may uh, uh, cause cancers in uh, certain groups of people in our catchment area. So in those individuals, we need to start screening. Right? And sometimes we have people in our catchment area who are heavy smokers. Uh, and we need to screen for lung cancer in those heavy smokers. And uh, to listeners of this podcast, uh, uh, I'd like you to uh, look into uh, uh, your, uh, uh, or maybe speak to your health professional about uh, what, scan what cancer screening uh, opportunities are, are, are available for you and your family members, depending on your age. Uh, and these screenings uh, will be uh, uh, so critical in detecting cancer early when you can still cure them uh, reliably versus waiting until this cancer gets too far along and becomes higher stage or higher uh, or, or more extensive. You'd want to catch them early enough so you can cut them out and uh, or uh, radiate them and, and not have them come back uh, at all. Yeah, so we did get some new guidelines a couple of years ago out of the federal government, right, that has broadened the eligibility of folks who um, want to get screened. So, you know, for instance, someone could qualify now if they, you know, smoked a pack a day for 20 years or two packs a day for 10 years, even if they've quit, Starting Correct. at 55. So really Starting important at 55, to get in there and yeah. get screened. And, and the screening for, for uh, those men and women would be a low-dose CT scan annually. Uh, low-dose so that you don't get a higher risk of radiation exposure. It's really a low-dose um, of, a, uh, of a CT scan that's, uh, that's used for lung cancer screening. And then for uh, uh, women, there's, of course... Uh, uh, the annual mammography that we uh, recommend for uh, you all after a certain age. Uh, for colorectal cancer, uh, your 
uh, colonoscopies have been uh, around for a long time, uh, but there's also what is called a, uh, a fit test. That's when uh, your stool, if you're in a, uh, a standard risk group for colon cancer, uh, there is a, uh, a test that can be done on, uh, on stool, on the stool. And uh, if that test is uh, positive and it's looking for uh, uh, DNA in the stool that's shed from tumors, uh, then if that test is positive, you then go and subject yourself to the colonoscopy. There are many ways to, to participate in screening programs depending on the type of cancer you're screening for. Uh, my recommendation is talk to your primary care doctor or to your health professional about what screening modality is appropriate for your age group. I'm, um, I don't think we can go through much of those details on this one podcast, uh, but with the message of, you know what, if you're aware that uh, cancer screenings are available, you need to talk to your health professional about what's appropriate for you and for members of your family within a particular age range. And don't get behind on your screenings. There's no excuse now. Uh, the COVID surge is over, and uh, even during COVID surges, we take all the precautions here at UC Davis. So there's no reason to get behind on your screenings, right? That's right. And, you know, the moonshot, uh, the moonshot reignition had a uh, particular emphasis on an all-hands-on-deck approach. So uh, President Biden called on um, everyone the private sector, foundations, academic institutions like us, healthcare providers, uh, as well as the general public, uh, calling all on all of these uh, uh, institutions and individuals to take on the mission of uh, reducing the impact of cancer in our communities and, and, and improving on the patient experiences. So I, I, think, um, I think an all hands on deck approach is what is needed here. <laughs> Here at UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center, we call that team science uh, because uh, solving the cancer problem uh, will not rest on one investigator's shoulders or on one doctor's shoulders. Good it really point. has to be a team. Mm -hmm. uh, only a team can give us the highest impact in solving, this can uh, in, in solving the cancer problem. Now, I think uh, Chris also brought up the K-12 uh, program uh, earlier, he did ask that. So the K-12 uh, program is a, a program that uh, uh, our listeners may not be familiar with. It's not kindergarten through 12th grade. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, what we're referring to is a long-standing um, uh, research uh, uh, training program that the NIH has had. It's called the K-12. That's the funding mechanism. And it, uh, we have one of those grants here at UC Davis. It's called the Calabrese K-12, where we are training the next generation of cancer faculty who will perform um, high-impact uh, clinical research. Uh, so uh, the goal of the Calabrese K-12 is to find the most promising clinicians. So these are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, veterinarians who are doing cancer research and then training them over a three-year period about, uh, about the best ways to pursue cancer research, giving them the skill sets, um, uh, having them acquire the core competencies that will make them really a well-trained uh, workforce in in designing and developing the next generation of, of uh, studies that will solve the cancer problem. So the Calabrese K-12, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the principal investigator of that grant here at UC Davis. We've had that for uh, the last dozen years. Um, uh, we're only one of maybe, a half, uh, maybe about a dozen uh, institutions in the country with a Calabrese K-12, and we're all uh, joined in the uh, with the same mission of uh, of training that next generation of cancer researchers. So every year we train about uh, six of these cancer researchers, plus an extra one uh, that's supported by our School of Medicine. So we have uh, any one time seven 
um, early stage investigators. These are junior faculty or early stage faculty who are who we are now positioning to be in this really uh, uh, launching pad for success so that when they uh, graduate from the K-12 program, they're experts mm -hmm. in uh, cancer research. And then when they're experts in cancer research, then they're able to then uh, develop uh, um, studies at a faster pace and they're able to translate translate those faster uh, versus the old way, you know, in the old ways, uh, about 30 years ago, what we would do is uh, uh, take somebody, uh, a promising person and throw them to the wolves and have them learn by experience. Uh, that's good for something, but it wastes a lot of time when instead you could take that same individual and arm them with the knowledge on how to tackle cancer research and and uh, arm them with the competencies early so that they don't have to learn uh, by by trial and error, right? Right. We, uh, and, and there's so a now, lot at stake. We want them to be successful. So that's what we do here, Chris, with the K-12 program. The Calabrese K-12 has been so successful in uh, generating a pipeline of uh, cancer investigators that... Uh, that uh, really would shorten that uh, uh, timeline uh, and therefore enable us to get impact sooner instead of waiting lifetimes. Well, and that then builds um, our, our effectiveness of our team science, like you had mentioned before, because we're constantly adding That's right. to our investigators. Yeah, and, and, these, and these investigators, when they're in the K-12, this Calabrese K-12 program, they are uh, trained to participate in team science. You're correct. Uh, they they uh, uh, cannot, they're trained that they cannot work on the cancer problem as an individual, that uh, there's no better way of solving this problem than by joining forces. When, uh, when we train somebody through the K-12, we mix them up with basic scientists, with population scientists and uh, and and uh, surgeons and medical oncologists and all of these uh, uh, clinicians all work together with one single-minded approach on solving the cancer problem. It sounds like uh, a great way to do it. And yep. uh, you know, we're we're putting out some really really um, terrific scientists um, who are uh, you know every day I'm seeing the kind of uh, studies and publications that those studies are coming out in that are very impressive. And uh, so it's very encouraging seeing the next generation, I'm sure. Uh, one last question. We're kind of going back perhaps to the cancer moonshot, because I know First Lady Jill Biden has been a real advocate for, for women's health, especially in the cancer arena. Um, we're we're really trying to expand our our women's uh, health, correct, at the Cancer Center. And how are we going to do that, Dr. Lara? We are. So for uh, for many years, we've been devoted to uh, addressing the problems um, uh, that we see uh, in, in women um, uh, who develop cancer. Uh, particularly, these are breast and uh, gynecological cancers, although there are other cancers that can sometimes uh, affect uh, uh, women preferentially. For example, there are certain lung cancers that occur in women, never smokers, uh, mm. especially uh, Asian and Latino women. Uh, uh, so there are those niches as well. But women's cancers have always been a high priority for our cancer center. Uh, uh, in the last decade, we've had a program called uh, the Women's Cancer Care Program, uh, which uh, focused our uh, clinical efforts in streamlining the care that we deliver uh, to women with breast, ovarian, cervix, and endometrial cancer. And it's been a fairly successful effort. Uh, in the past year, though, we uh, sought to energize this effort uh, through the recruitment of uh, Professor Laura Fedgerman. She's a basic scientist, but she does uh, 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 laboratory and community research relevant to uh, breast cancer in Latinas. And uh, we brought her on board to help co-lead 
our Women's Cancer Care Program, together with Dr. Gary Leiserwitz, who is a GYN oncologist, and uh, San Dr. Sandy Borowski, who is a pathologist who specializes in breast cancer. So we have a core group now, Dr. Fedgerman being uh, the lead and Drs. Leiserwitz and uh, Borowski being her co-directors of the Women's Cancer uh, Care and Research uh, Program. And uh, we've provided them the oversight and the authority further expand uh, this uh, women's uh, program, um, uh, Steph. Uh, so we provided them the resources. And uh, uh, for example, we know that the this program that we're lovingly called, we've lovingly called We Care, has now hired a project manager that will help uh, coordinate these efforts more intentionally um, and, uh, and, and provide a spear point Towards not just the not just exceptional clinical care, but also exceptional research in women's cancers, and uh, we uh, hope that in the next uh, five years, uh, the We Care program will uh, uh, will have an even broader uh, er a broader focus and uh, be guided by uh, team science grants that will underpin it and and uh, be able to support uh, its sustainable efforts over the next uh, five years. Thank you. This is, um, you know, speaking as a, a female, this is a really important area um, that I, I'm just really proud that the Cancer Center is is taking on and, and expanding. And, and we really look forward to seeing where we care goes. Yeah, Thank and you very much, Dr. Lara, for joining us today on our inaugural Beat Cancer. Um, it's been a very, very informative hour. And uh, like I said, we're, um, we're really um, fortunate um, that, that you're providing this sort of leadership and, and vision for the Cancer Center. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to uh, be your inaugural uh, guinea pig for the uh, for the beat cancer podcast. I will say though that uh, uh, the uh, the mission of uh, reducing the cancer burden uh, in our communities uh, begins with people listening to this podcast. Right? There's nothing like uh, the community being. Um, partners in this effort. We have been harping on team science all hour long, but that team includes you, the listener. Um, uh, we need your support. Uh, Absolutely. Your voice is important in this effort. Um, uh, we need your voice in the way we uh, design our research. We need to hear from you because your, uh, your voice does truly change the way we design the research and design our clinical care. Design, it, it changes the way we uh, deploy our resources out in the community. So we need to hear from you, not just you hearing from us through this podcast in a one-way uh, direction, but we need to hear from you and we would be happy and ecstatic <laughs> to uh, uh, hear from you. You're part of the team, the listener. Uh, and hopefully, uh, when we have many more of these podcasts in the can, uh, we could expand our uh, listening audience and get more participants in our team, uh, because that's the only way we can solve this cancer problem. Exactly. Well put. And I think Chris uh, will know how to direct folks to giving us that type of feedback. Thanks, Dr. Laura, for joining us today. We truly appreciate your time and your conversation. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email directly to beatcancer at ucdavis.edu. Beat Cancer is a production of the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. For more information on our NCI-designated Comprehensive Cancer Center, please visit health.ucdavis.edu slash cancer.